Right, okay, so we're back online now, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to continue with our comp and try and integrate our um, bar scene here with the, within our footage like we did uh, for the film. But before we do that, there was an interesting conversation we had at lunch about um, the way that you're saving the EXRs for, for, um, for use within Nuke. And it's good to note that when you're kind of saving your file as an EXR, Within the setup, we talked a little bit about um, the kind of 32-bit float and saving it as half float and using the RGBA. But the storage type also becomes quite important within Nuke because you don't want to save the, um, the image as tiles. You want to save it as scan lines because Nuke automatically reads things as scan lines. And you can see that in the way that um, the kind of image scans the page down as it's kind of updating. And it also, you can see that when um, like in the previous comp, when we're actually bringing in 3D cards, the way that Nuke reads that data is through a scanline render node itself. So Nuke works in a kind of scanline ray trace way, um, not in a kind of bucket way like V-Ray does. Um, so you just have to be aware of that, and it's a good point um, to point out. Um, so make sure you're kind of saving your images um, to Nuke with that feature on in the XR. So let's get back to our comp. <clears throat> and let's look at um, what, we can do, what we can do here. Again, it's kind of awkward working in three windows like this, and we, it is much, much, you do get much more room to kind of play around when you're working on two screens. Uh, it's definitely a program that needs to work on two screens, because um, you really want to kind of have lots of space for your, for your node tree. But while you're editing, it's always nice to see what's going on in the, uh, in the viewport here. So all we've done, again, to recap, is we've rebuilt our, um, our RGB. We've not done anything else to it, and it is um, looking exactly the same as our RGB, but obviously the background is not, is not on, and we don't want that anyway. So we looked at the alpha and how that kind of like pre-molts um, all of our kind of layered multiplied alpha out from one, from one pass. Um, we can also start to plug in the Z depth, and we can see what that's kind of doing there. Obviously, that's too extreme for what we want here. So essentially, we're inverting our Z depth, and we're grading it. But we want to kind of grade it a little bit stronger than we've, than we've got here. And again, we're seeing our entire model here that we've built, but we're not actually going to use all this stuff over here. We're only going to use the thing, of the, uh, the inside of our model here once we alpha it out. So let's just look at this grade node and kind of chain, change this down, create more of a contrast. So we're just kind of giving ourselves a little bit of data to play with here. It's kind of like lighten slightly through our bar, kind of a bit of atmosphere in our bar. We're alphaing out, so we're kind of flattening all of that data to a kind of single, a single alpha, which we can see here. We're adding a bit of chromatic abrasion, and typically we'll leave this off until we're exporting. Um, it's nice to kind of test it and get it working at this stage, but um, normally we leave this off until final export. Likewise with the next two passes, if we kind of look at the, um, the depth of field, which is just using the, um, the Frischlift plugin. So I've got the Frischlift um, plugin um, enabled within Nuke, and this gives me my depth of field. Works exactly the same way as the, um, as the one in After Effects does. So if we double click this and have a look, we have our radius, our focal distance, and so on and so forth. So if we kind of activate that and press 1 on our node to see what it's doing. Probably not much, we don't want too much depth of field. If we increase this, we might be able to extremify the effect. You can see that it's working, but again, we only got it on a small amount because we're using quite a, um, we're using, we're using 18 millimeter lens, so there's going to be hardly any depth of field um, on our shot here. So again, it's kind of being true to life. <clears throat> we're then using our Real Smart Motion Blur plugin. So if we go down to that, we can see that we're creating quite a lot of motion blur at this point. And although we did bake in some motion blur, we kind of try and do a half and half um, to give ourselves a little bit of flexibility. 
on some shots we kind of render uh, when we have to bake in the motion blur on shots like this um, we want to kind of give ourselves enough of a head start that it's kind of aiding our real smart motion blur but then we don't want to um, do it too much so we can't take some of that back or add some of that in post basically um, and you can kind of mess around with we've, we've kind of done lots of different tests with the um, um, the kind of velocity path that you can export within V-Ray and we've had limited success to be honest with that we could there's, there's lots of ways you can do that within um, within uh, within Nuke you can even use um, the kind of source here for um, you can plug in the real uh, the uh, velocity pass here um, so the real smart motion blur does support the velocity pass um, but again we find if for this particular shot we found it much better to kind of bake in part and um, and then just add our kind of pixel motion here. But I'm just going to turn this down a little bit. It looks a little bit too extreme. Again, you, what you want to do is you want to match this to your footage. So I think at this stage we definitely want to bring in our footage, especially if we want to um, start kind of grading this in. So we'll bring in our simple JPEG sequence. And we'll have a look at what that looks like here. So all we've done, all we've done here is given it a slight. Now we haven't actually graded this. We've just put these in place for grading. So we kind of leave these grade, color correct, and color lookup nodes there, so they're ready for grading in the kind of standard setup we have. <clears throat> so if, if we now click our merge over node, which is what we have. So what we've got here is that we've kind of piped in our feed through our depth of field on our motion blur. And then we're kind of piping it into our main tree here. The reason why we've kind of extended this out to the side is because when our comps get large um, and we want to be able to turn off the motion blur and turn off the depth of field all in one, when these are all lined up, what you can quite simply do is select them all on the side and press um, D, and then you've deactivated all your kind of like heavy layers, which are going to slow down your viewport. Um, so that's just that's just why we have this going to the side here. Um, we could just have this pumping down here and then feeding back in. It's just graphically we have it on the side so that we can turn it off very easily. We're going to ignore this light wrap feature for a second. We're going to talk about that more um, on another scene. And then what this line is doing, it's kind of going into our merge over node, right? Ignoring everything else apart from our merge over node for now. And this is saying that this layer is at the bottom, our footage is at the bottom, and our render layer is, is kind of merged on top of that. So everything is Anything that's above anything else is like a layer system um, going down. So let's have a look at that. If it updates. Another point to think to um, talk about with Nuke is that I haven't saved for a while. Um, however, Nuke has a kind of micro save where it saves every, uh, I think every second or every two seconds or at least every few seconds. Um, so it automatically has an auto backup. So if I close this now and didn't save it, if I, re if I, if I reopened Nuke, then it would basically give me um, an option to load the um, backup file, which is dated, which is kind of saved newer. It will warn me that the backup file is newer, and so I can open my um, th that file and save again. So it's slightly different to the way auto back um, features work in other programs. So we can see our comp. Um, our, our render within our comp, and it's already sitting in quite well. You know, it's already sitting in really well. I think what we've done is we've matched. So the motion blur is actually not far wrong here. If we look at the kind of the blurriness level of our post versus our um, what we've kind of added to that post, it's close. It's probably a bit sharper here, so we probably want to turn it down a little bit, um, which we'll do now. And once we're happy with it, we'll just disable it while we continue. So let's double click that. And let's turn the um, blur amount to 0.5. One is typically quite high. Um, and you can see now that that's kind of sitting in a little bit better. So you, what you kind of want to try and do is match the blacks, match the match the match the blacks, and match the light and dark points of our of our image, because what we've got here is quite a um, a flat export of our footage. And although it's just a JPEG sequence, it kind of it still represents where our um, well, what the levels of our, of our kind of raw footage, which will then swap out with our kind of um, un, 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 um, kind of un JPEG footage, the kind of EXR footage that we rendered out um, of our background, we can kind of bring that back in at the same level, and then we'll grade everything together at the end to, to give us our look. 
For this project, we kind of rendered out everything relatively flat um, from Nuke, so that way it could have a, a, a bit more control in the grading, because um, it was graded it was graded elsewhere. We kind of we kind of produced a few scenes which were kind of our suggestion for the look and feel, and then that was kind of taken and um, we we took it to a grading suite and we worked on it there separately. So we're happy with our motion blur and depth field. We'll turn them off for now. <clears throat> And then we've merged this in. Now, what we've got here, if we just scroll back slightly, probably want to turn down our, our Z depth. It's not quite working at that point. So we'll just adjust the grade. It's kind of give us our look that we want. Again, if you look at his head, his head's quite light. And that's got, that should be quite a black area. He's in the foreground, so we don't really want to go darker than that. We probably want to adjust the color slightly. So that feels a little bit better if we're going to grade this afterwards, because this is going to become much darker in the foreground. So we don't want our background elements to be darker than our foreground elements. Okay, so what this is doing is a space for our matte shadow and our AO. And this looks a little bit complicated, and this is just us. Um, this was a kind of workflow that we developed when we um, were bringing in um, dirt passes which were alphaed out, and then you get the kind of black background. And this allows us to um, kind of create a lighter background um, underneath our um, dirt pass, which can then um, give us um, what we want, which is just the black areas of our contact shadows being um, being the bits that we're kind of multiplying on. However, we've, we've changed this recently where it's just sometimes it's easier just to um, do that when in After Effects, where you're kind of bringing in the dirt pass with a kind of um, alphaed out background, and then you're re-exporting that as a simple JPEG sequence, which is all you need really for a dirt pass, um, and, and plunking that straight back in. Let's try and illustrate um, a simpler version of this. Again, for this shot, we didn't use our dirt pass. We baked it in, if you remember, because this is exactly what was happening. If we look at this, that material we created, that kind of particle, um, that kind of animated material, doesn't like um, the kind of gradient ramp here, so it's kind of giving us this black surface. So we didn't use this in the end. So. Let's go back to our comp. The matte shadow is something we're going to talk about on the, um, on the next shot because what we've done here is that we've baked in our alpha, right? So our alpha, if you remember when we were talking about the matte shadow material, our alpha is baked in. So in that material for this, for this context, um, we've unchecked the effect alpha channel. So it's so that they are, um, or we've checked rather the effect alpha channel so that our contact shadows and our kind of light that this, is, that this object is creating is actually affecting directly our alpha, not just the matte shadow material. So in this, in this method, it's good and bad. It's good because we can kind of bake in um, our alpha and the, and the contact shadows will work, um, you know, work fine. If we see, if we take off our um, render completely, if we unplug this, so let's just put a little dot here so I can go back. If we unplug our render, you can see that there's no shadow there. If we plug it back in, the shadow's there. And we can kind of play around with the alpha and blur this slightly to get this better. But that was probably also if we, um, if we created a slightly more accurate model, and then we'd get slightly better um, shadows. But again, with the motion blur activated, that doesn't matter too much. Because as soon as we add motion blur to this, you're going to see that kind of smooth out anyway. So we weren't too bothered about that. But that's essentially our shadows are baked in to our render pass here, right? So we'll talk about how we use this and how we use the matte shadow material on the on the net on the next shot. But in this shot, we kind of baked it in, um, and again, we would at this point we were trying out different workflows. So we were kind of like on each shot. This was our first project learning Nuke. This is why we're kind of showing um, a few different shots where we kind of figured out a few different things basically. So it's good to kind of go through, and you can see already how. Um, from this initial comp, 
which the base principles are all there, you know, all these different elements are there. It's just that we got used to organizing, organizing things in a slightly more graphical way, which then more people can kind of come into and understand, basically. So that we develop this kind of template um, so that people can kind of come in directly and, and know what's going on, just labeling everything, basically. So we'll talk about the matte shadow um, in the next scene. And we'll leave the ambient occlusion because we haven't got it. We, ha we didn't um, render one out for this one, or we're not going to use it. So essentially, just to kind of simplify this, this composition, let's, um, let's just bring this guy. Let's delete these two because we don't actually need them to simplify it. And again, this looks a little bit complicated, but this is developed because we want to essentially create our roto masks. So we can talk about that a little bit. So our roto masks um, are essentially rotoscoping nodes. So if we click on one of these, we can see that we've got a line here, which is kind of surrounding our, our main character. And we've got one of these for lots of different elements, like the gaps in, it, in, in there. We've got one for the, um, for the bike. And again, um, this roto node was actually created by a um, a junior person that we kind of employed from Escape Studios in London and basically did this completely wrong. So it's good to kind of show what, um, you know, what's wrong about this. Well, you know, it sticks fine. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a clean roto. So what, what's, what's kind of, what's wrong about this, this method of, um, of kind of rotoscoping? You know, we've got all these different elements but it's not, it's, not an efficient, it's not an efficient workflow for rotoscoping. So if we click on our, um, our Daniel character here, the way you should rotoscope is to create simplest forms as possible. So he's, we've already got some quite natural, simple forms in here. But what we want to do is we want to separate out the head, we want to separate out the ears, we want to separate out the arms, we want to separate out the torso into separate roto nodes. And all of that can be within one, noto, one, one rot a roto node, we just add more layers into our um, scene, and we and we start naming things slightly differently. So all of our new, all of our newer stuff, we're doing this in a complete, in a, in a much more organised way, because it sounds like more work having to create more more shapes. But if you think about it, you're doing a, you're doing like an oval shape for the head. You're you're kind of animating and moving that. Um, if we just kind of go to our rotoscoping here, we kind of we need to animate and move that. Of like over however many frames, and then we do the same for kind of s spheres, you know, or kind of ellipses for the ears. Same for kind of like again general shapes for the for the kind of torso, and then same again for the arms. We're creating kind of like ellipses and sausage shapes um, kind of forms to kind of follow our shape, and that means that we can kind of run through one pass of one element really quickly, go through it again with, a, and we just have to be a lot less careful. It's a lot more work to actually go and move all of these small, minute little points around. And, we, when we, and we're only kind of starting off with like rotos with four, four to six kind of um, bezeers in, rather than a rotor like this, which has got, you know, 40, 40 bezeers or something like that. Um, and we're having to manually all of, animate all of those in one go. It's much more efficient to kind of take it in stages and do, do the head, the ears, um, the arms, all of that separately, basically. So again, this was done for all the elements we needed to do um, to cover our scene, which gives us this. So we had to also do some elements of the, um, of the roofing here, because um, if we look on our feed, let's just turn off our motion blur for speed, because that's always the one that's going to slow us down. We've kind of got some elements where we need to kind of cut out. On the, on the top, on the tops here. So that will give us a roto view like this. The way that you plug that in is quite simple. Um, you can have all of your different roto nodes. If we create a, a new merge node, and we can kind of like um, with the A channels, we can kind of start to add in. And, and the B, we put both of them in, sorry. And then once we add both of our inputs into two roto nodes, we automatically get another little line that comes out. And that allows us to kind of keep adding more and more 
feeds into our merge node. Sometimes he gets a bit hidden. Yeah, so we've got that. And then we want another one coming out to go to our other merge node over there. The reason we've got this is because essentially when you've got lots of different um, comps or lots of different render elements that are kind of um, um, covering your footage, you might want to use the same roto nodes to kind of mask different areas so or different, different renders that you've rendered out. And you don't want to have to kind of copy and kind of paste these things and then, you know, merge them into another, another kind of pass. You want to be able to use the same, the same roto nodes, you know? You don't want to have to have clones of them because they, they're not instanced. If you had to make any adjustments to this, it's, it's, you know, you're going to have to make them again or copy them again, and it's just a messy workflow. So what this, what this does is give us our feed. So if, I'm, if I delete when I've, this one here, these are all plugging into this, this merge node, and then I'm creating this kind of like train track effect, which then goes up. And we can see that um, in a kind of less than optimized way for this comp, but we'll see it a lot more in the next comp when we're using this workflow a lot more successfully. But essentially, if we have another um, merge node at different areas of our model, and we create a few more dots, then we can quite easily create in an upward motion this feed, which then le feeds back into our mask, right? But we don't want to put that mask just to one node. We want to put that mask to, um, to the, all of our feed. So normally it's just good practice to put, if we want to add more nodes or more um, roto nodes around, just to kind of mask onto a merge node and then feed that into our dot. And then we can add, again, multiple of these in. And this is, again, all we're doing here, it sounds kind of complicated and it's quite hard to explain, but all we're doing here is we're kind of allowing this, all these roto nodes to, to, mer to go into our merge over, and then we're feeding that around our scene. So we're feeding it into here, which is, in, which is going into our main scene here. So this is kind of essentially cutting out everything we have along this line or everything that's feeding into here. But it's also piping this, this, this feed um, upwards, and then it can, we can kind of channel it into lots of different um, areas, or lots of different additional renders. Because we'll have multiple of these setups all throughout our scene, especially in this kind of shot. So we might want to kind of use the same roto nodes to cut out different renders. That's all we're trying to do there, right? So presently, we don't have to do too much um, grading for this scene. We've, got, we've actually not graded anything yet. So our, our kind of like scene is already sitting in, you know, quite successfully. So our lighting on our HDI worked really well. Um, but if we wanted to, we can kind of go in here and we can start actually, you know, grading this in a little bit more. These are clearly um, not helping. So we'll delete those and add in our own. Start off with a grade node. And again, I tend to start with the kind of gamma if I want to do any color adjustments. But to be honest, there doesn't want to be much color adjustments on this file. We might want to kind of warm it slightly to kind of match some of the kind of tones under here, especially because we've got kind of warm lights. Let's just go back to our feed. Let's let this figure itself out. It's got slightly confused a second. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. Let's see if we delete our viewer, let's move our viewer up. Let's go into our roto feed. On the odd occasion, you do have to delete the viewers um, and then put them in again. Very rare, but it does happen. Okay, so whatever that was, we've got rid of it by deleting our viewer and then um, putting it back in. So if we get any kind of issues in our, in our kind of um, 
viewer here, just delete the viewer and put a new one in. Sometimes the kind of graphics card might get confused or I'm not too sure why, but it happens. So let's go back um, and just make a subtle grade on this and try and get it a little bit warmer. Kind of going with those yellow hues of the kind of image, but not, not saturating things too much. And then again, it's just about taking out the black slightly, which is really easy with the black point. Um, might want to take down the kind of whites a little bit. And then I think what we also want to do is kind of go into our, um, if we look at some of our, what our nodes are doing here, we've got our kind of refraction. I think it'd be quite nice to add a little bit of a glow of our refraction to get some of these um, lights and things kind of glowing a little bit more, and bottles. So we can kind of go into here and our glow node, we can, have, we can add a tint so it's not white. We can kind of create a bit more of a warm kind of effect. see what we're doing there directly. And that's quite nice. It's giving us a bit more of a kind of glow. Um, we might want to play with all sorts of things um, like the, the reflection pass. Let's have a look at that, all the specularity. See, this is where kind of naming your poster stamps comes into play, but we're doing this for the sake of speed for now. But if we kind of get a, if we kind of want to increase our specularity slightly to just to create a little bit more highlights on some of our glowing objects, some of our uh, shiny objects, sorry. I want to increase this value a little bit just to kind of boost some of the kind of specularity. Give things a bit more of a highlight. Again, so just to kind of emphasize, this is a completely different to kind of just plonking screen or color dodge or anything like that on top of your render. You're not kind of burning pixels by adding to your RGB. You're just changing the values of these different parameters, basically. And so it's a much kind of nicer, non-destructive workflow for kind of editing your RGB and passes. So for me, that's kind of sitting in quite well. Um, I'm happy with this. Um, I think the kind of distance fog is working enough to add a bit of atmosphere in there without looking washed out. We're kind of happy with our specularity and our glows. Um, so for me, this would be ready to kind of move on to the next section, basically, you know, which would be kind of adding another one of these um, down the line, which will then, um, because there's lots of different elements like the shutters and the kind of posters and all different kinds of things were added to this one. And it was just, all it was was copying this whole system and then replacing the renders out and changing these parameters of the, um, of the grading each element separately, basically. So once you've kind of got this set up, um, it's very, very easy to, um, to kind of like replicate and uh, continue with your comp. If we bring in, what, what, what we're also giving you is um, the kind of base script for this file. So if I just merge that in so you can see, again, just how this repeats. Um, so if I go to C school, VFX, nuke, nuke template script. <clears throat> So this is essentially the file I'll be giving you, which kind of um, shows you how the background footage should be pumped in here. We grade it a little bit or however we want. We have our kind of first render, render layer here. And again, rebuild the RGB, all these different elements we've just been discussing. And then the same thing just gets copied down and down and down. Just to note that the thing that's at the bottom of your, um, of your tree will be in the foreground, right? So your, your background is here, all the layers are kind of going to be working down from there. So anything that's in the foreground will be at the bottom of your comp. And when we come up, we might have overall grade um, on top of everything. And then we want to write this out. So that's essentially the base, um, all the kind of base template is that we do, that we try and use for all of, our, all of our comps now. And all this is, is a miniature version of that. The only thing we've done differently recently is just started with this, um, 
uh, read files, and then we're loading all of our other passes on top of that. We can still use some of these passes, like raw lighting, in the same way that you would use the raw lighting in, um, in, in Photoshop. Um, you know, sometimes you want to put that on soft lights to kind of increase the kind of contrast and the kind of um, the levels in your scene. Um, we can, we can, we've got all kinds of extra multi-mats that have kind of been exported that we might want to kind of fiddle with and change the colors for. Um, but for now, this, I think this is working enough for what we need it for. Um, but if we did want to kind of add a raw lighting, let's just illustrate that. We'd probably create a new, um, a new section within our renders here. So if we just kind of move this up slightly and we drag this down to make this bigger, and then we kind of drag all of this stuff down a little bit to give ourselves a little bit more room. And we might want to create a new, um, a new area where we're kind of adding these adjustments. So it's color correction. And again, you can kind of tweak, the, tweak this to your, own, to your own liking, however you want to work. But uh, you might have kind of an overall color grade, which gets the base um, kind of looking a bit closer. Because the, the last thing you want to do is to go in and alter all of your, do loads of kind of multi mat selections and grade everything separately per material when you can just achieve a very close effect to the footage with a single grade node. And then if you still need to make lots of um, color adjustments, then you might want to use some of these, um, some of these elements, like our, our uh, guys here. So we'll kind of line these up and we'll, we can use these um, within grade nodes and all sorts of things to kind of give us our material adjustments. So if we just quickly select those and press backdrop, and then just kind of like create a new space for this. You know, we can kind of link these and do whatever we want and change our, change our uh, materials of, of different things. We can label this um, adjustments. And then we can also have another area for, um, for kind of like adding other passes that are not part of our RGB rebuild, right? So we can call this passes. And then to, again, the key node you want is the, um, is the merge node, but we'll use it in a slightly different way this time. So we'll pipe in A to B. Let's just plug in there. We can see that we're not too bothered about what this looks like. We just, we just want you know, all this. We want to kind of boost our kind of light quality here. So we double click our merge node and it's on over at the moment, um, which is going to do nothing really. It's just going to kind of place um, A over B. So this is going to be completely replacing our image pretty much. Um, we don't want to plus it in. What will happen when we plus it in, it's going to kind of like add it to the RGB in some strange configuration. So we, we can just use this in the same way. We've got all the kind of like standard Photoshop um, kind of blending modes here, which we can play around with. Um, so we can use soft light and we can start to kind of mess around with this, um, take down the mix mode and kind of add this some point three or whatever you would normally do in Photoshop to give you that just added, added kind of light effect within your scene, emphasizing the lighting that you've already got. So however you normally use this in Photoshop, you can use it in a, sim in a similar way here. So it's finding out how you like to, finding out the new features that you can kind of offer your workflow and then and also finding out how it can do what you like, what you like doing um, in your existing pipelines. Um, there is a kind of tutorial out there which teaches, um, it, it says if, you, if you're kind of learning Nuke and, you, and you're used to After Effects, beware because there's a, there's a tutorial that advertises, it as a, as a size, advertises itself as a good tutorial for um, people who like After Effects to learn Nuke and it's absolutely useless and teaches you some very bad habits. So that's the kind of reason why I'm trying to teach a slightly more professional workflow within Nuke. Again, I'm quite confident with this workflow because it's something that um, we were taught by a uh, senior compositor at MPC. So it's not just me that's been faffing around on the internet for a few, a few months. It's, um, it's a professional workflow that we got taught for a few days. So. And we've kind of like created this ourselves, this kind of workflow of um, just labeling things, but that's, that's just a personal preference. You can do this however you want. This is essentially, we have our RGB rebuild, color correction, passes and adjustments, and then our, um, yeah, so adjustments, sorry, here, and then passes here. 
Fog here, alpha here, chromatic abrasion, different effects. It's all kind of piping down into our tree. So if we just have a look at our result, don't think we actually used this for our scene, so we'll get rid of that. Turn back on our set depth and depth of field. Uh, real small ocean blur. And we can see now we've successfully comped this part of our um, render very realistically into our footage. So then if we um, turn this off and on, we can see exactly what we've done. We've replaced um, this wall with our new um, fish bar um, with kind of like lights around it. And this is all animating, so. And we all know what that looks like now. I've shown it enough times. If you look closely, you can see actually the roto is not that good because it wasn't done properly. If you look closely, right, we can self-admit some of the mistakes. There's some wobbles. This head is slightly cut at one point. But to be honest, you're not really looking at that. You're looking at all the, the crazy stuff happening around him. So, <laughs> but again, if you really like look at this shot, you'll notice a few mistakes. But it's part of it. This was a, a very intense um, shot, and you're not really looking at that. You're overwhelmed by all of the detail that's kind of going on, and that's kind of the point of it, really. So again, these um, shutters were kind of um, made in, in, the, in the right place and rendered the same lighting, um, animated and rendered in separately. These kind of like um, ornaments that are kind of swinging down, they were um, rendered separately. So that's another, that's three already. Um, we've got all the posters which were put on cards um, in, in Max, brought, in, brought into Nuke in the same way that we've done the, um, uh, with our test example. And then we've kind of put them with um, textures and we've kind of added that on top of our um, model in a kind of multiply, in a multiply mode on our uh, merge node. We've got another kind of rendered element of, an, of another set of kind of signs flying out of these um, flying out of these shutters. So that's already five. We've got our um, girl sign here, which is kind of flying in. That's six. We've got our um, gills bar sign, this big giant gigantic fish that was rendered separately. That's seven. And we have um, more ornaments that are kind of hanging down. That's eight. And then we have all of this kind of elements on the right, on the left here. So that's nine. So that's nine separate um, pa render passes this one shot alone and these were all comped um, separately so before I move on to the next shot are there any um, were there any questions so far with um, with what we've done here it's quite a lot to take in but hopefully it should be a relatively simple more visual workflow this is why we try to create this and showing this to you today because it's a little bit tricky when you start looking at this and trying to break it down and what th what this is is essentially a much more messily laid out version of this. So were there any questions? Anything on mind? All right. <clears throat> Let's have a coffee. And if we wanted to kind of have a look at this comp, we can see that we've got our animated signs, which are kind of uh, mov files. So these are animated mod files. These are plugging into time offset nodes, which are then put onto planes, um, which are kind of exported from Max. All of that pumping into a C node with our camera projector, which is rendered out. And then we're kind of um, pumping that into a system here, which is then um, glowing certain elements and then merging over into our main comp. So this whole area here is just for kind of animated signs. Um, we've got our posters, which are, again are um, just these ones in particular were rendered rendered out in the right place and then put onto in merge overlay. And we've got kind of smoke cards and um, and debris which we're using again in the same way we've kind of exported our camera. All of this data is kind of um, been time offset, masked. Certain elements might be rotoed from those from those bits, graded separately, and then put onto planes. And again, all that's piping into a scene node. So once you know the basic principles, you can kind of like 
use your imagination with how you can then add to that and create really complex trees. And that's more or less it. So let's have a look at, um, if I just save this as a temp file. <coughs> So let's open up um, another shot. Let's open up the cart scene. And this scene, uh, I'm not sure I have this one separately actually. Let's have a look. <coughs> okay, I do. So let's have a look at this scene. So this was the shot where we kind of um, did our um, trailer animation yesterday. Um, and what we're going to be looking at is kind of like this element here and how it kind of differed from some of the techniques we were using on the last shot. In particular, it was when we started grading the shadows of all of our renders separately and using the technique that I've been explaining with the matte shadow uh, material. So again, if we look at the kind of breakdown of this shot, we've got our raw footage, We've got our posters that we've been um, we're kind of painting and then we're putting onto cards in, in, um, in Max, exporting with the camera and we're kind of overlaying that on into um, in Nuke. We've got our trailer animation. We've got our simulation. We've got our previs. We've got our render, render of the passes and the grading, and you can see directly there, the shadow is separate to the render. So we're not baking in that shadow with our alpha. We're, um, we're se rendering it out as a separate pass, and that's giving us loads of control to actually um, get the colors matching right, because the, one of the problems was that we couldn't get the colors of our shadows to match exactly the colors of, our, of the footage. So we, um, it was much, much better to have that separate control so we can match things a little bit more accurate. Okay. <clears throat> Let's have a look at this scene. Thing to note is that um, when you open up a file in Nuke, you haven't actually closed down the file that you had open a second ago. So it's good to kind of just go through and close a few files if you've got lots open. So let's have a look at what we've got here. Now, the only thing I've relinked in this file is the trailer, because that's all we're going to be looking at. But essentially, again, we've sli this is um, a slightly more organized file, um, but it's not got the full, work the full kind of visual workflows are as, as what we've been doing. But the principles are, again, exactly the same. We just haven't got as many um, uh, backdrop nodes um, with different colors and, and text defining what we've got. <clears throat> but it's exactly the same. So we're going to simplify this comp. We're going to just work with the, um, the trailer. So we're going to delete everything else. Before we do that, we're going to save. And then delete everything apart from our, our trailer and our shadows. So you can see exactly what we've got here. So we've got our trailer. We've rendered our trailer. Um, what we've done actually here, we rebuilt our RGB, but then we decided actually we don't want to change anything. So we've got it there rebuilt but we've actually bypassed that and we've plugged straight into the RGB because we just didn't need to um, go to that extent for this file because we, there was nothing really we wanted to change. We didn't want to boost the specularity or the, or, the, um, or the reflection. We didn't want to put any glows anywhere. So it's not always necessary to do that. It's you have to render them out just in case. But um, maybe 30% of the time we just use the RGB because we're, not, we're finding that we're happy with our raw render and we don't need to make so much adjustments. So let's have a look. So 
our, our raw RGB is very much like this. It's much more red. Um, it kind of blends with our kind of like background footage slightly here because that's just what we've rendered out of Max and that's not quite what our um, actual raw footage is doing. If we look at our raw footage, again, it's a very, very flat piece of footage. Um, this is our EXR export. So this is, this is our, you know, this has got um, the full amount of data in it. We're, um, we're kind of grading back the, um, the you know, the blacks and the, and the levels. And we're making subtle adjustments to the kind of hues until we think it's working well. One thing we've done here um, is we've key lighted the sky and we've kind of just boosted the sky slightly with saturation. Or rather with the grade, sorry. We're using a saturation as our kind of source for our um, key light and we've selected the blue. You can see what that's doing there. Just to give us a slightly less gray sky. <clears throat> so that's our base, we're happy with our base. And now our render is not going to quite match that base because we've made those adjustments. So if we go to our raw render, what this color correction is doing is here is it's kind of like um, bringing back our levels for our main object to what our, what our adjustments we've just made on our footage. So if we delete this one because we're not using that, and if we just disable all of this for now, and we can kind of see what we're doing step by step. Turn off our motion blur. Go to our merge node so we can see <clears throat> what our trailer is looking like on top of our footage. Let's just disable these for now and you can see exactly what we've exported. So this is our trailer, this is our footage. Our grade node is kind of taking away those reds and they're bringing back um, the kind of like um, cyans and and more blues into the image, basically kind of matching it roughly. And again, do this before you do any of the other main adjustments, because there's no point kind of going through adjusting all the material separately. Just make sure, just add a grade node and get it as close as you can with a single node um, before making any other specific adjustments. So what we're doing here, we're, we're, in this case, we are using our raw lighting. Um, we're also kind of boosting our um, reflection a little bit more. And so we're putting that on screen. So I guess this workflow is a little, a little because we're not rebuilding our RGB and we are kind of overlaying and screening um, common passes that we would do also in Photoshop. This is probably closer to you know, a workflow that we do normally within, um, within Photoshop um, because we were happy with our RGB. You know? We didn't need to change anything here. So let's just disable these and see what they're doing. Not much, but they're doing a bit. So kind of a boosting our reflections, lightening those areas a little bit. And then again, the raw lighting is just picking out some of those highlights a little bit better. And then we're, um, again, subtle um, corrections to the kind of brightness of the metals. So we're, we're essentially selecting our, um, our blues here and we're kind of grading them down because they were the, the kind of like the metals were kind of a little bit too uh, pingy. So you can see exactly what that's doing. It's kind of trying to match roughly this stick with our, you know, the kind of metals on our rim of our bike here, say, rather than kind of standing out like that. Um, and then we're also grading our wood a little bit more to be a little, it look, looks a little bit flat there, looks a little bit too light. Um, the rest of the scene is much warmer. So we're kind of warming up the, the wood slightly. Again, just to repeat, this is just all within um, the mask and then selecting the channels um, for, from, from our multi-mats. Um, again, we're changing the, um, the darkness of these crates a little bit. Changing the tires, changing the oranges. We probably made that adjustment on a different frame where we can actually see our, our oranges. Taking down the hue. And then essentially we're doing the same thing with our alpha. We're copying the, um, the alpha channel here and we're pre-molting it out. 
And what this is doing is giving us a completely clean alpha. We haven't got any shadows in it on our object. Unlike the last shot, where we were looking um, at the kind of baking in the shadows to our alpha. And again, <clears throat> what we'll do is just to kind of um, really be specific about, um, about this setting again and the differences. So in our max file for our base, for this scene, we have our effect alpha button here. And this is within our V-Ray material wrapper. So by having that checked, right, the objects that we put into this scene that are going to be reacting to this environment are going to bake that alpha into, uh, bake those shadows into our alpha. By having that unchecked, we're going to have essentially what we have in this shot, which is a clean alpha. But we still retain that information in our multi mat shadow material, right? And the alpha of that is still the same because all of it affects all the passes, but our RGB is this. So we've got an RGB of our shadow. And all we have to do is shuffle out our um, RGB to alpha. So then if we click on our um, one on our shuffle node here, and we go to our alpha, it's the same as our RGB, right? Well, the reason why we've done that is because we're kind of we're kind of bringing that in, and we're kind of like um, as a mask. Oops, let's just delete this. And let's try and explain this on the model here, on this kind of scene here. And then what we're doing if we double click this is that in our mask it's RGBA alpha, so it's going to kind of read the alpha. Um, through our kind of pipe here, and then we're multiplying that on as we would normally. And we don't have to multiply, we could grade. So if we put a, um, a grade node in here, and we did the same thing, we piped in the mask to that stencil. Let's just disable this for now. We can do the same thing. We can grade our, um, our shadow as we want. And that means we can change the color, we can try and match this guy, um, so we want to make this more blue. It's not making it more blue. Uh, it is if you change the grade uh, here. So if we click on, we can cl change the color of any of these wheels. So we can kind of create whatever we feel is close. that successful this one. If we press um, if we press alt and then click on the little number next to this it will kind of reset the um, it'll reset our um, whatever we've adjusted back to default settings. So it's quite useful to kind of get used to that. So this gives us a huge amount much more control um, of kind of getting our shadows looking good then if we then bake that in, because it'd be really difficult to kind of grade that shadow to be a specific color if we baked it in. And the only reason we, why we've got this stencil node here, um, which is kind of complicating visually um, our, our setup, is because the stencil node is essentially taking this mask, but it's also combining it with our main masks here. So that means we can, this roto pipe system that we developed can kind of cut our main render, but it can also kind of cut into our um, any other elements we add. And this is kind of a little bit more complicated um, a setup, and it really just needs a, a slightly more of an understanding of Newt to kind of understand um, the different parameters of the merge node, basically. Because the stencil is using, it's literally stenciling these two together. So if we simplify this for the sake of this tutorial, because we've, we're not if we don't want to cut out our woman and our van and our car. The reason why we've done that, obviously, is because in our comp we have lots of things that pa pass in front of this um, scene. Like this car, right? So if we didn't use this stencil node, and we just masked straight into um, our shuffle node, 
then we're not masking the shadow. You know, it's going to be on top. The reason why we've put that there is because we can um, not only mask this grade um, or tell this grade to use from our, our um, matte shadow material, we're saying also take into account all these other roto nodes we've made. So let's have a look at this again slightly. So we have our, our woman, uh, we have our van rotoed out, which was very rough. It didn't have to be accurate. It's just because it's such a fast moving object. Um, we have a woman that kind of appears here again. Um, she's, she was very rough. Um, we have different elements of our bike. If we just click on each one. Click on this, we can see them all. These are just different bits that we're kind of rotoing out in different areas in the same method. So we're happy with that. Um, we have to make sure that we kind of add our real smart motion blur to also to our V-Ray map shadow material because that's in a separate location. Um, it's not going to be affected by the real smart motion blur we have here, obviously. And again, we want to match this bike with our trailer here. So that now that's kind of sitting in quite nicely. You can see that um, because we kind of looked at our roto nodes and we clicked on them, you can see this kind of red line in the viewport and you can't, we can't seem to kind of get rid of it. Pressing O turns off overlay mode and it means that you can just get rid of any um, roto or kind of graphical elements that you use to build things in your scene um, separately. So this kind of, it's in viewer mode and kind of construction mode is this O, o button. <clears throat> and then um, to finish it off, we've got our dirt, which again, we rendered this out in After Effects and we forgot to um, change the frame range within our composition. Um, so it started from zero, even though our comp doesn't start from zero. So we can, we can render it out again, or we can just simply put a time offset node in there. And that's just going to match our, our, our time here. And what we actually did for this, because we were um, rendering that, this out back out in After Effects anyway, we also um, added the motion blur in After Effects. So we didn't have to have another real smart motion blur node in here and um, adding kind of complexity to our scene. So here we've got our dirt mode on top. So that's pretty simple how we kind of um, added our trailer here once you understand just that we have to do the shadows separately. All this is relatively straightforward. It's no, nothing different to what we've done early, early this afternoon. The only difference here is that we're kind of um, grading our shadow um, separately and we're adding in our um, dirt separately. You can see that this is above our merge over node. So this is our, this is our node that's bringing in our render. And then if we just get rid of this, this grade, and then essentially our, um, we're using this twice, we're kind of doubling up this multiply effect uh, so we, we, to get a darker shadow, um, because we didn't feel like it kind of worked with just one. So this is, we, could, we could have one, but we've got two here. They're, they're doing the exact same thing. But the important thing is that they're above the render, and that's because they're under the render on top of the footage. So footage at the bottom, shadow next, and then the render. That's kind of how it works. And the reason for that is because um, it's not just the actual shadow, it's the kind of contacts for the entire scene that it's creating. So we, don't, we definitely don't want to grade all of this stuff because we're going to grade, that's going to be grading on top of our render. You know, it has to go underneath the render on top of the footage so that we're kind of actually like grading our footage there and then we're also then putting our render on top. See? Were there any questions about this kind of particular setup by on in the in the room? Or online. Okay. Right. So hopefully everyone's with me um, and they're kind of excited about trying out new count for themselves and their projects. I'm going to look a little bit in detail at the inside of the fish scene that we were quite happy with, uh, but never got used. <coughs> and this scene got, this whole kind of section got cut from, um, from the film by film four, and they never quite understood, understood it. 
and it uh, yeah just didn't make didn't make the final cut, which is a shame. We keep talking about making a kind of director's cut version, but um, just haven't quite got around to it yet. So what we've got here, if we look at this scene, is a fully rendered shot um, with green screen footage of our characters within the shot but they 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 they're not moving that's the thing these these were these characters were filmed on um i think a sony camera i'm not entirely sure but they were filmed in a green screen studio and um from a static location because we knew exactly what we wanted to do for this shot we knew that they were going to be um we we're going to have a digital camera movement and we were going to put them on cards so Again, in Max, I haven't got the Max file with me. This, this file would never work in a tutorial. Um, it's probably the heaviest file I've ever built. Um, it, all of this kind of caging and skin was all um, made in ZBrush um, and brought in. It's a very, very heavy file. And then all, a lot of this um, architectural stuff was actually quite heavy as well. So there's nothing too special about how any of this was textured, apart from the ZBrush bones and skin, which were more evident in some of the earlier versions. Um, which we don't have here, which were a bit, um, a bit more kind of gory and fish-like. This is kind of a secondary, um, a secondary version. But essentially, <clears throat> what we needed to do here was obviously build our scene, do our camera move, um, get all happy with that, and then we had our cards in position. And in Max, what we did was we, um, on standard materials, we just had our, we key lighted our characters in a very rough way. Um, we saved out a black and white mask of that key light so we could use that as a um, opacity map and then we essentially have that available in our viewport within Mac so we can previous and see what's going on um, very very quickly. I'll try and illustrate that in um, one of the making of videos if I just Go to the end, you will see the fish. So this is our, this is our fish at the, at the end, and this kind of shows some of the design of the fish, um, and also kind of how some of the visual effects were working. Also goes through a couple of the different iterations. So initially we were talking about um, this kind of folding out and animating away and revealing the old town in this quite magical magical moment. So there was a little bit of work kind of experimented on with that. <clears throat> we have our character green screens keyed and then this is why we're kind of pre our model where some of this, this was all kind of proxy geometry um, which rendered in a much much higher resolution. Um, we have less of the town in this version, much more of the kind of skin in the fish. Um, but we can see we've got a great pre of what's happening with our characters here. And you can see how we're kind of lighting this in certain areas, kind of glowing the the structure and the skin. But what the first iteration of this became was something a bit more gory. <laughs> and I, th I think Film 4 didn't like it because it's, it almost kind of suggested that he's gone to hell rather than going to kind of his version of heaven, which is kind of the old town. So we made it much more fantastical, much more about the town, and they still didn't quite like it. Even put fairy lights in and everything. So there was a few shots that we kind of um, did for this. But essentially what this comp is doing is we're, again, we, we are using our rebuild of our RGB in this one because we're making quite a few adjustments to different things, specifically the sound of illumination, specular and refraction. Um, we might even be messing around with um, different opacities for these different things to really get a good base render. So let's see what we've changed. So if we press 1 on our RGB, press 2 on our uh, rebuild, you can see that we're making some subtle adjustments, we're glowing the lights, but this is essentially not far off what our RGB is doing with a few extra glows 
and things like that. So we're, ma we're using our masks, we're colouring things, um, we're making some general adjustments. If you look here, we're kind of, we've got our edge text map, we're kind of like using that in dirt. We're also kind of like soft lighting that on, which is slightly different, just adding a little bit of brightness to the kind of um, the main faces and darkness in, in the corners. That's giving us a slightly more dynamic look. We're using it in a normal multiply way as well. What we're doing here is we've got our Z depth. We're inverting it. We're grading it to red. And we're kind of like streaming that back in. We've also got a version here where we're kind of grading it. And we're multiplying that over. But then what we're doing is we're kind of inverting that, or we're kind of masking that with an inversion of that of itself. Again, again, it's quite hard to explain those things, but it should be relatively visual. So essentially we have, um, we have our merge node. Um, we're kind of like grading different things here to make, to make it colorful. And essentially we're masking that with um, an inverted graded um, image. And then we're shuffling that out as an alpha, right? And we're plugging that into a stencil node because we want to combine it with a separate roto, which is masking this foreground area. So that's again illustrating what the stencil node um, or the merge, the stencil version of the merge node does. It's kind of combining two very separate um, pieces of, um, of masking information. And the reason why you need it to be stencil rather than merge, because before, if you remember, we were plugging in lots of roto nodes to a merge node, and that was working fine, and it was, just on over, it was just on over, like a normal standard merge node. The reason why you have to put stencil on is because this has alpha data with, uh, in it already, and it's a roto node, which is very different from shuffling out um, RGB data and making an alpha that way. And the stencil node is the only, is the only node that's going to read two separate, mask, two separate masks in the, same, in the same way. So we can see here, that we, if we kind of click on that and we click on that, we can see what we've got. We didn't really want this bit down here, so we've just stenciled that out, basically. And we could have feathered this a little bit if we wanted to, just by, you do this by clicking on Control. And we will have a little brief look at the Roto node in a second. Um, I don't want to spend too long rotoing live, but um, we'll kind of give you a, a, a sense of what these nodes are about. They're pretty similar in most software, so it's not exactly rocket science. But essentially we've now got our kind of graded background. We're also kind of screening on a little element to make that more intense because you'll notice here we're overing that on rather than screening. So that's why we've had to kind of mask this, this, this foreground area because we're not, um, we actually want this to be um, not adding lightness to our scene. We want the actual color from this. So it's like having it on, it's like leaving it on normal in Photoshop rather than in screen. So the over, the over mode is kind of comparable to like normal um, blending opacity in, um, in Photoshop. And we're just essentially putting that in the background, but then we're in also increasing the intensity of it here. And again, that's just by grading the Z depth. We have our chromatic abrasion again, which is done in the exact same way. Um, I actually don't think we use this one, this, uh, this screen mode here. I think that was always turned off. But we experimented with it. And again, we can plug in this, the same Z depth is kind of going in lots of different directions here. We're using our depth of field. That's kind of subtly blurring the background. We don't want it to be too evident because again, this is filmed on a lens which wouldn't really pick that up too much. So it's again, being not too extreme. We have our um, motion blur here, which is probably being very subtle. The camera's not moving too much. And then essentially, what we've got here is um, our two pieces of footages. So there's a few interesting things here. 
one of which is um, the key light feature, and we're kind of keying out uh, the green screen, and how um, in certain shots we had to kind of still manually roto quite a lot of stuff, to be honest, even with, even with the green screen, as careful as you might be. Um, and then we've also got this light wrap feature, which I kind of want to talk about, um, which is really great for kind of blending your um, kind of elements that you've got on top of your footage or CG um, by kind of wrapping the kind of pixels um, that, that come in contact with that background around your, um, your characters in a kind of realistic way. Like light bleed, basically, is essentially what it is. So let's have a quick look at this. We've got our footage here. So this is Malachi. He's one of our actors. And we're kind of like time offsetting this piece of footage to be where we want it to be when he appears. Um, and then we have our key light. So that quite simply gets rid of everything else. Now the key light, if we try this again, if we, if we do this in a separate file, um, is a really nice um, tool within um, Nuke. I think it's also available for After Effects and several other, several other things. It's by far away the best kind of keying um, option that we have for this software anyway that's kind of built in. So if we had another one, let me just see what's happening here. So we kind of like, what we want to do is we're plugging our source obviously. And then what we want to do is we want to select our footage, yeah? So there's all sorts of different options we have within tuning. And we can get into that in a second. But what we want to do is we want to um, press control and we want to kind of try and select the green elements of our image. Turn the back on. It's kind of inverting it. Let's just make sure we're getting a good selection. Once we've selected a base, we can kind of like start tweaking this selection. The main ones you want to change are obviously the screen gain. And you can also, it's sometimes better to, um, to work with the, uh, <coughs> the mat rather than the footage so you can see exactly what's happening here. And again, that's just within here. So you can see your source or you can see your uh, final result or you can see your um, source mat. And then you can really start tweaking how this is actually blending together. And you can kind of blur the edges. And there's lots of different features you can use to try and <coughs> make your mask better. And soften different features. And very quickly, we've already got quite a decent result. It's quite a good green screen even though we've got some kind of crumpled effects here. Um, the green is kind of like very different from any of the colors. So we want to select our final result in our key lights. And then I've got another one here, which we don't need. And then what we're doing here is we're also combining this with a merge mask. Um, our roto node and our roto node is just essentially hiding everything else that we don't need in our scene. So that gives us our final result here. So again, there's lots of features within Keylight which we can play around with and, and, and tune. Sometimes we don't get a quick result like that. Um, we have to really go in and make some fine adjustments. For one of these shots, which was kind of, anim we animated the time of the, the lighting within this studio. And uh, if we look inside, it's the, um, it's the first one. So essentially it's very dark. And then our kind of lights turn on. And then we kind of basically had a piece of footage uh, that we, we shot for this in the studio and we kind of animated the, the lights turning on manually and we had certain cues when the lights would turn on. And then we use that footage as a base to then animate all of our lights coming on in the same, in the same way. So 
in theory, when our lights turn on, he, he, he's, it looks like he's been reacting to that. So when this light comes on specifically in the foreground here, you see him light with it. And then likewise, right at the end, you have a, a window that turns, the light in here that turns on, and we see his light on his face at the exact same time. That was a really good trick that we used, but this one was an absolute nightmare because um, there's no way we got any kind of key information. He's behind, he has a, there's a green screen behind him there, but we're, we're shining a red light on him um, with a kind of green screen in the background, um, and we're kind of animating from dark to, to light, and it was just, there's no way we were gonna get a consistent key. We tried for ages, we, I think we tried for a day to, um, to kind of like animate the kind of tuning of the key light to kind of pick up different tones of green at different times, and it was just a complete nightmare, so this had to be rotated from start to finish which is never fun. It's kind of oddly therapeutic on a Monday morning if you just can't be asked, but um, other than that, it's a complete, um, yeah, it's not very nice to do. But everyone kind of has their stint of, uh, of doing a little bit of roto, including myself. So we have a, okay, sorry, we have a short question. Let's get the mic so everyone can hear. I just wonder with the lights, if you animated the lights in 3D, or did you do that in post to turn on the lights? Um, no, we did all of that animation in 3D. So we wanted to, because we, we wanted to, I mean, the, the, the actual shot is, is all 3D. Um, so the camera's slowly moving forward. We have our kind of candle lights, lighting, lighting, or our kind of like little lights. We have lights within here, within, within the spaces, I don't, I don't know how I'd go about lighting that in comp. I mean, it, this, we could have done it a few ways. We could have camera projected a few different, um, different renders with different lights turned on if we wanted to be a bit more optimized. This was a fully rendered scene. I guess if we wanted to kind of be less expensive with this, then we could, um, we could render different images when certain lights are turned on and then create a comp within Nuke or After Effects where we're... Um, we're kind of animating those layers turning on at certain times, um, and then we project that animation back onto our geometry through a moving camera within Max. That would probably be a quicker way. Thanks for realizing that now, Paul. Um, but, um, but yeah, at the time we had, we had the render farm was free and we just wanted to do it all in 3D basically. But yeah, you could, you could do it in, a, in lots of different ways, that's it, I guess. Turn the mic back to Jeff. Okay. So this is the key light again. This is our masking of our um, of our kind of elements that we don't need. And then again, if we just pump this back in and just see and turn some layers off, see what's happening. You can see that he's sitting, he's sitting in, in the right place, but he's not quite sitting in, you know? It's not quite working. So, first of all, we want to grade him with a single grade node as close as we can get to what we think he looks like. And then inevitably we make a few other subtle adjustments. Um, he wasn't lit properly in the scene, so we're kind of grading a, um, a kind of we're grading a much lighter version here, and we're masking. Um, just turn this on. See our roto node somewhere. But look what we got here. So we might have to. Adjust our viewer again. Yep. Let's just see if that issue again is because of our viewer. If it's not, if you find that the viewport's not updating, delete that viewer. Add in a new one. Bit of a pain in the ass. Um, and then let's just find where we want to 
look at and press one and see if we can get that to work now. It's just, ah, I know why. The reason why we can't see our roto when we're, um, when we're looking at our viewer there is because we're, looking, we're trying to look at a roto that we created before it's actually pumped into our scene, right? So if we want to see that roto, we have to click on our footage, and this is where we're actually selecting that roto there. So now we can see that roto. The reason why, because that roto is relative to this size. This was filmed on 1920 by 1080, um, and this is just a card. So we, we're kind of rotoing it before, when it's still a flat, full resolution image, and then we're then pumping all that information into our scene through our camera. So you can see here that we're grading the top of him here using a, a roto mask because we've got lights above him which weren't in the studio. And then again, we're kind of grading the side of him slightly more there with another roto, which is giving us a bit more kind of light from the side um, because we've got these strong yellow lights in our model. So we're pumping that on a plane, on a, well, it's, it's kind of referencing an OBJ that we've exported. That's kind of being put on a plane, which has kind of um, got some uh, data, kind of uh, tr point data of where it actually sits within that scene. That's pumped into a scene node. We've exported our camera. And that's being um, run through a scanline render at the relevant size, 1920 by 1080. And then the next interesting thing is our light wrap. So if we go to our merge over node here, if this is making any difference. Again, on our character here, it's very subtle, but you can see that we're actually wrapping a band of um, color or light around our kind of character, and it's giving us a little bit more pixel information from our background. We can kind of change all the parameters here, but I think we'll look at this on the other footage where you can see it much more obviously. We're also kind of matching our depth of field or our out of focus. There's no depth map. We, we can just simply use the out of focus um, node from Frush Lift, and we don't need to use um, a Z depth. And we're just matching what we're kind of replicating in our render. And then the same thing is happening with our character. If we just delete this and disable these guys. So we've kind of time offsetted our footage. Our footage is not really moving. Um, our character is simply wandering around. If we just go to, it's kind of moving in this kind of general way. So our, our camera is completely still. We've actually got a little bit of animation of the light at the start there, which can be a quite annoying. Because this is still when we were thinking about um, having the kind of um, fist transforming around him. So we were kind of moving the lights and changing these kind of intensities of lights in the studio. Key lighted him out. Same process. We've got our roto here, and we're just kind of masking that. And then we're grading it as kind of close as possible in the first grade node to our, to our background footage which is in this case a render. So that's piped through again, the same process. And then we've got these light wrap nodes here. So let's have a look at what they're doing. So you can see here that we've got this quite harsh line around our character, which is quite unnatural. And what we want to do is create a bit of light which kind of reacts more to the scene. So you can see here, this kind of orange color here is bleeding into his ear. And we can kind of have a lot, quite a lot of control over this effect. And actually, this little A sign means that it's animated. Any of your nodes, any of your nodes that have this little A sign will mean that they've, they've got some kind of animation within them. And that's because the light changes quite a lot when this, when this guy moves around. And also, because we had to tackle our light difference on him, 
we also had to animate our grade node on, on him. Because when we looked at the footage, um, because we were animating the lights, whereas in this scene, our 3D, li our 3D lights are not animating, we have to kind of animate this grade node so that he, he, be he becomes consistent along this footage. So again, that's relatively easy. And to do that, if we put a new grade node in, double click him. If you right click on the little curve sign here, you can say set key, and that'll automatically put make this blue, and that'll mean you're now making this an animated parameter. So we're, we're on frame 1444 here. If we move over to here, It'll take a little bit of time to update because this is a decent scene. And then we can grade him however we want. And then you'll find that when we move between these keyframes, um, it's, it's automatically animated, basically. Another thing about the timeline, which I haven't explained yet, actually, is that um, this number doesn't mean anything. This for FPS, we can change this to 25. Um, doesn't, really, doesn't really matter. Um, there's this setting here matters though, the global setting, the input setting and custom. So the global setting will be whatever your S is, whatever your frame range is in your system uh, project settings, right? Your input is whatever your input setting is. So as soon as we click on that, our frame range is now from 8,086 to 18,070 something or something like that which is pretty ridiculous. So obviously that's why we have our time offset, time offset node here um, to get the right points that we, that we needed. We've actually taken the JPEG footage, which is a bit naughty of me here. This, sh this, should, be, um, this should be an EXR. We've got a little bit of um, JPEG, JPEG artifacting, but it didn't matter because it wasn't bloody used anyway. Um, we can see here, I set up tracking markers on the, on the background because some of the um, some of the uh, shots we did for this were, were tracked. I'll show you which ones were. And we, we, again, we did quite a lot of work for this, you know. So we've got a shot like this. So this is a, this is a track shot. But we use camera projection for the background. So we had um, a few poles that were kind of um, covered in green paint which also had um, kind of tracking markers at the top. So we had a little bit of parallax. We weren't just um, limited to the background. We had um, some yeah, 3D poles within the space um, around Daniel um, to create that parallax, to give ourselves a few, a few things. And, and then this shot was manually tracked. Um, no, I don't think any auto track features were used. It was just manually tracking the, um, the points that we knew were solid. I think there's a, a B to that, which is slightly zoomed out, but it was, one, one shot, we just split it into two sections. So you can see, yeah, the, um, the points here. And we did that with just um, some bits of green tape with um, some pen, uh, permanent marker dot in the middle of those to create these kind of like non-intrusive but very obvious tracking markers. So let's just have a look at, um, let's delete that grade node that we don't want, but that's essentially how you add keys to any of these nodes. Is right click, set key, and then we wanna set our um, timeline back to global. You'll see these blue keyframes here, um, and if you, zo you can just zoom into the timeline and you can see it a little bit clearer and do things more specifically, um, but that will automatically change this to custom and you'll have to manually set this back to input or global um, to get back to where you were. Um, if you wanted to edit the position of these keyframes, you can't really do that here. You can't select anything. Uh, you can't select those keys. Um, you have to go into the curve editor, which is just next to the node graph, right? Um, you don't really use this very much. This is why I haven't really talked about it yet. But here's where you can kind of like play around with the, um, the curves and the positioning of these, um, of these keys, and you'll see it automatically update here, so we've now moved these keys elsewhere, there and there. Um, but we don't really want any of that, so we can just delete this node anyway. So that's just next to the node graph, curve editor. Um, I'm not using the dope sheet, to be honest. So curve editor there. 
let's just delete this gray node. Because we deleted those keys, it's got rid of that A symbol on it, so you can tell it's not animated, just in case you weren't sure. Um, but this one is animated. It's animated quite a lot between um, the different light on his face there to the difference in light there. It, there is a quite a large brightness difference in the scene at the beginning when we're turning off that light. Um, what we're kind of doing here is we're kind of rendering out masks. And again, that was done for the, uh, for the comp, like I was saying. So we had this built while we, while we were building um, the comp and we used the previs as our base. So we're, or we're kind of doing both at the same time. We're kind of building our um, 3D and we're building our, um, our comp at the same time and we're, we're understanding what we need to do using both programs, you know? So we're kind of not deciding what we do in comp later. It's not a kind of post-process that kind of works, um, works very, you know, together. So this is, that's, that's the mask that we kind of exported for the, um, the kind of opacity for the material in comp. Okay, so let's have a little play of this light wrap material, light wrap node, because it's pretty cool. Let's delete, let's uh, just kind of disable these and put another one in. Now, there's a kind of structural diff, uh, way you have to kind of add these in. If we just kind of disconnect this one and we just put this one within our node here, what we have to do is we have to say we want this light wrap to light wrap over our background footage. So we have to put a little dot in just above our merge over node and we have to kind of connect that with our B channel of our light wrap. Just for kind of graphical sake, I like to press control and then clean this up. So we're kind of like organizing our, our tree and everyone can see that this light wrap node is going into this, this feed here, All right? So let's have a little, let's go to a frame where you can see the light across his body a little bit more. Let's just, for speed, let's just get rid of some of these um, depth of field and motion blurs. Again, it's always good to work only activate those when you're kind of rendering them out. This is instantly making our viewport a little bit faster. We're still on custom, let's just go back to input or, or global so we know where we are. So we're still right at the beginning of this. So let's go somewhere, say here. So if we can see by default, our light wrap's not doing a great deal. Because our intensity is on zero. You can see as soon as we start increasing our intensity, if we if we dramatize it, you can see what the concept of it is. So it's taking the kind of color bleed of, of our um, surrounding pixels and it's kind of applying that within our um, alpha shape that we have generated here. And also the light here is kind of spilling out all the lights kind of spilling out on top and it's creating a really nice effect all by it, a little bit dramatic at this stage. Um, but there's loads of parameters you can kind of mess around with in here. So diffuse, obviously, is kind of like what, how intense that is near the edge. It might be quite nice to have quite a strong light edge to this. You know, it's giving us quite a nice already there that, always, that already looks more realistic. Like the light is shining through his beard slightly better. It's kind of catching him in, in a nice way. It's probably still too intense. But you get the idea. So if we, we can kind of, what, what I quite like to do is have a few of these um, doing different things. So we might have one which is a bit more intense doing a kind of sharp highlight. Um, we might pick another one. And again, what we'll do is we'll add a dot there and just attach it there so that's feeding into our kind of tree. And we'll um, increase the intensity, um, we'll increase the diffuse, we'll kind of like, you can increase the foreground and background blurs. We might want to create one that kind of covers more of his, this either does the hot, the hot spots of the effect, you can kind of blend it more across the, across the whole um, shape. Saturation values, it's also quite nice to play with. Um, yeah, all sorts of different parameters you can kind of mess around with. Um, 
you can kind of generate the wrap only, which is quite interesting, which you can then, I guess, use to screen on top or use in a different blending mode on top of your other footages, but you'll have to kind of pipe this into your feed in a slightly different way. Um, disabling the luminance base wrap won't read the kind of uh, the pixels around the outside. It will just give a, a general overall effect, which you might want. Because you might want to have an overall glow around him, um, which isn't linked to the kind of pixels around the outside edge. And then enable glow um, does what it says on the tin. It kind of adds an outside glow to the kind of edge of your um, of your light wrap, so it's not the effect isn't limited to inside the kind of um, the area here. So I quite like a subtle outer glow, just to again feather the transition between your footage and your um, and your background. And all of this adds to just the realism of your scene. Something that might obviously be needed um, all of a sudden gives it a lot more um, believable comp. <clears throat> so if we disable those and plug back in um, the ones that I originally had, which are animated, we've gone for a slightly more subtle effect, I guess, with my one. Um, but we have, um, this is animated to kind of be more intense in certain areas um, across the timeline. That's why they've got the little A next to it here. So then, once we've done all that, we're essentially down to our grade. And we're writing out um, our sequences at the bottom. And again, for writing out sequences um, with any comp within Nuke, Create a new folder in here. CG school export test. Type the name again, CG school export test. Uh, dot hash 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 dot exr. Save. And then we're basically ready to. Um, render this out and we can pick our frame ranges. But what's also good um, is that we can render in the background and then set how much of our system memory and thread limit to actually use. So it's not like rendering in After Effects when you have to wait for it for ages. Um, it's more like the new Photoshop where it kind of just this is in the background. So we can say, okay, take six of these and eight of these and, pr and press okay. And what that's now done is it's created a kind of dummy file of our comp and it saved it somewhere else. God knows where it saves it. I think it saves it as the temp file. Um, and then you can still work on your scene, right? If you just press render without rendering in background mode, you'd see this computing, you'd see lines glowing, you'd see something happening, right? And you'd know that you won't really want to mess with anything because it's going to change how it's exporting. Whereas rendering in the background, you can still edit and work on this file, work on the different nodes. Um, and you don't have to worry about um, the, 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 the kind of this not working or this not work or this not rendering out. So you can see here, it's taking two hours for some reason to export this out. Now, this will hopefully go down, but this some of these scenes were quite heavy and there was quite a lot of data that um, it, we're kind of pumping through it. Now, if we want to, if we want, if we're in a rush. Um, when we created this, we weren't really in a rush, so that, that was fine. We can let that go while we do something else. Nuke doesn't take up a load of m memory. You know, um, we've got a few files open. It's not using much of our CPU. So it's, it's fine. We can kind of leave that to render in the background and get on with some other work. Um, but if you did want that to go faster, what you'd do is you would um, basically create some write nodes and do what we were saying before and actually start writing out, probably after your um, out of focus and motion blur, we'd probably write out there your scene, and then you'd plug it back into the comp as a flattened, as a flattened element. So once you're happy and finished with, with, with all this, you don't have to, when you're exporting um, everything in one go. Similar to our approach to, um, to Mass Effects, and you're kind of doing things in stages and baking things um, in stages, um, you're doing the same thing um, in Nuke, where you're kind of baking out elements separately and then plugging them back into the scene uh, and you can always go back and re-export re those things but it just really it really lightens up your file when you're um, when you're working in this way 
we could kind of have a, a, a um, we could even simplify this to the extent that we had a write node here. And this was exporting um, everything we had above this point. So this is all of our motion blur baked in, all of our kind of rebuild of our RGB, which is very heavy. Um, we bake it in here and we bring that back in um, to, the, to the comp. So we'd have a, you know, a file here. If we just represent this with a um, postage stamp. So this would be our new um, sequence, EXR sequence that we've written out here. We'd probably have these together um, somewhere that we can kind of see visually what's going on and name it, name it as such. And then we do the same thing down here. We'd have, um, you know, we'd, we'd replace all this, we'd bake in our light wrap unless we had, um, uh, no, we can bake in our light wrap, that's fine. Um, so we can have essentially three flattened EXR sequences to write out at that point. And then that would render out very fast, you know. So there's lots of ways we can kind of avoid um, having to wait two hours and 30, 25 minutes for that to explore, basically. Hopefully that makes sense. Were there any questions at this stage by anyone about anything that we've covered? No one thought over lunchtime any key questions to ask and challenge the group, like I asked, hey? This must mean that I'm teaching very well and I'm making everyone um, confident with what I'm teaching. Or, yeah, 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 save the questions for the breaks, someone said. Any questions online? No. All right. Well, I was expecting more questions because I was expecting this to be quite new for everyone. So um, we were slightly ahead of time. But there is one thing that I was going to um, go through, which was us explaining slightly, um, let's just save this as CG school. Explaining our kind of attitude to still images within ArcViz, standard ArcViz. So if we go to uh, where we are, VFX, like still image workflow. OK, let's load, a, let's load a scene that we've been working on recently. Uh, oh no, let's just see if we've got anything linked here. Yeah, still got the files linked. Okay. So uh, let's just try and see what kind of errors we've got here. Just don't need that. Don't need that. Let's just have a look. Where are we getting any errors? Let's just have a look at our So this is a kind of raw render from a recent project that we've done. And um, this is kind of like a mid-stage, I guess, um, in the process. And how we've started using Nuke within projects, a standard kind of project would be kind of like 5 to 12 images for an architect. Um, and in this particular case, leading onto an animation or a film. And for these kind of things, especially working with um, you know, certain architects, it's, it's, it's going to be really tricky to um, keep feeding the, the, uh, the, uh, the images to the architects and the developers um, with good information, updates um, all the time. Sometimes you kind of build in fixed, fixed um, kind of like issues to the architects, but sometimes it's much more of a kind of process, especially with a project like this where the design wasn't necessarily um, fully realized before um, issuing the kind of information to us. So it was a bit of a designing process and a bit of a marketing. It was somewhere between marketing images and 
a design and process. They, they were used for marketing uh, purposes, but um, we weren't issued with kind of final information. So there was lots of changes to this project, right? Lots of changes, lots of issues of renders. And the, what we've started doing, and we're going to use for all of our workflows now, is rendering out 2K images um, of our scenes. And that two, Nuke can work with 2K very easily. Um, it's going to struggle to go to 6K with, with, with a, unless you've got a really fast network and a really fast um, graphics card. Um, but um, what we're using it for isn't really for final production. It's for all the kind of niggly stages in between. And so basically, if we have our read nodes here, what we'll do is we'll have all of these read nodes stored in a current folder for the, for the render of this project. So um, what we'll do is we'll render out, we'll render out the image. We'll, we'll save this within um, a dated folder, or, what, or the current folder, rather. Um, and then we'll, what we've started to do is set up this as almost like a batch command, but using Max and Nuke, where um, we have our, and we've kind of gone to like extreme referencing, where we have a, all of the model files referenced into a, um, a cam lighting file. And in that cam lighting file, you've, got your, you've, you've just got your lighting and your cameras, as you would normally. But then that file is then referenced into a render send file, right? So the render send file has got nothing in it apart from your um, apart from an area to send your render. And what that means is you can send that to Backburner or wherever, uh, whatever system you're using. Um, and then whenever you update the camera, the lighting, the um, any of the models, you can just press restart on that. Um, um, node restart on that job in Backburner and it's going to update everything for you and it's going to render everything out in the same current folder and all these nodes are going to are going to update automatically. So what that does is gives us this mega fast workflow of um, of essentially um, rendering out a set of images, setting up a comp like this. Now we've got the comp set up, we don't have to do that again. And then basically all the models are worked on by several different artists throughout the day. Um, the lighting is slightly changed, um, and then essentially all we have to do is select our um, folder within Backburner. We press restart, and it's going to essentially take all of that new data, render it again, update these files, and then everything we do here, every adjustment we, we make is automatically updated. So that gives us a huge speed advantage when, we, when it comes to changes, um, where we overnight or over lunchtime will have an updated set of renders that we can simply press export, and that is rendering out a JPEG, um, which is linked to an InDesign document, so that basically overnight we can kind of like press restart on all of our jobs, right? And then it automatically updates everything, and we automatically have an updated InDesign document, which we have to PDF out and we send to the architects. It's completely streamlined our workflow for, Im for image sets. So we'll have um, a, a, fo a folder like this, a, a kind of system like this set up for um, every single camera, and then all we have to do is go into the nuke files and render out and, and press write and render that back out. And you can just see the power of that. So it's kind of using um, a, a tool traditionally used for VFX and compositing for, um, for kind of like um, you know, shots that we've just been doing, kind of CG within um, footage. I mean, this is not far off. It's just a still version. We've still got an image of our, um, we've still got an, this is the rendered version of the, of the building, but this is a kind of image of the, of a tower next door. So this is a photograph which is replaced in the same way as you would normally. We've got our sky that's rendered through our, our render here. We've even got our people that we've done in Photoshop and brought them in as a PNG here. So we're kind of testing that. We can kind of do everything in here. So again, we're just kind of doing a lot of stuff we do in Photoshop, but we're doing it in Nuke in a kind of way that we can see everything, which is quite nice. Um, and then again, the glows and the grading and everything, it's all 32-bit and it all works fantastically. And we can, again, we can, a lot of the, when you get into Roto, you can kind of um, you can do lots of different custom Roto masks. You can use um, Roto Paint, so it's again it's exactly like um, painting a mask in Photoshop. When you get into it, you will find that you can do everything you can do in Photoshop um, and, and more, and it's keeping that 32 32-bit data set. The disadvantage of this workflow is that we thought we could just literally pump in our 6Ks and export, and it didn't quite work out because our network's not fast enough. Basically, if you've got a very fast network. That, will, that system will work fine. Um, what we've also started to play around with um, is essentially instancing um, all of these nodes to a separate 6K comp 
labeling this 2K, labeling another one 6K, and then whatever we change within our 2K comp automatically changes this in our 6K comp, and then all we have to do is export. We haven't got that workflow down yet, so I'm not going to go into that because it's not, it's not ready. But it's something we're playing around with to tr really try and streamline this, the, the, the development process of images. Because it's really annoying when you're kind of um, creating a comp in Photoshop um, of a kind of to do an issue for an architect and um, you've set up all your masks and everything and, it, and it's really annoying to go back and change all of that, redo all your masks and that kind of thing. Whereas here, even if you change your camera, it's gonna, all your masks are gonna, are gonna stay exactly the same. You know, that, that green mask you've got here, you know, that's, a, that's gonna update, it's gonna move um, with your new render set. These are all postage stamps, so it's, gonna, it's linking to the main read, note, read nodes. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful workflow that uh, more and more people should adopt, in my opinion. Um, and then essentially what, we'll then, what we then did is that we used this to develop the 2Ks once we got complete sign off of everything, so people, um, materials, textures, lighting, then we just render out our 6Ks. Um, we faffed around with this for a little while to try and get it to work um, and then we hadn't quite figured out that workflow with our current server so we replicated what we had set here in Photoshop but then you only have to do that once. It's not something you have to then go back and do again and again and again and again for every single issue. Um, and we take this even further for um, other, other, other things, like for example, when we're doing chalk passes and camera sets, we basically have, um, we set up for this file in particular, 12, we brought in all 12 chalk EXRs, and then we kind of had mini comps for each one, um, giving it a little bit of um, depth of field or whatever it needed within here. And then we had like write notes for each one underneath, and then we, we had one comp which had all of our chalks in when we were signing off all our camera views. Um, which we can just write out, write out, write out. Again, linked to an InDesign document with JPEGs, and that gives us a huge amount of um, a huge amount of speed advantage with, when, in, in the, the development process with um, with architects and developers. Um, were there any questions about about this kind of workflow? Again, there's nothing truly, there's nothing too special. All we've done with this image set is that we've essentially we've extended. Our, our, our rebuild and editing to give ourselves a little bit more room. So we've got our rebuild RGB in this, exactly the same way as before. We've got our other passes, which is taking things like our raw lighting and our raw reflection, and we're kind of messing around with screen and overlay with those things. We're, um, we're grading the, we're taking the raw reflection and we're kind of only using that in certain sections by masking it with the glass, for example, and then we're kind of merging that over. It's the same kind of process, but we're kind of giving ourselves more space and more areas to work with. So we've got our dirt, sea depth, you know, the kind of like fog, and then overall kind of grading levels here, which again will automatically be updated. And then if there's any alpha, we're kind of um, alphaing that in there, which is kind of the opposite of what we want. So that's our render and that's our background. So then we can shove in our image there. <clears throat> yeah, we've got a question. Let's pass the mic over one sec. I, I'm curious, the one hang up that I have like with seeing Nuke is the ability to like dodge and burn and custom paint stuff. I think you might have been starting to get to it with you were talking about painting rotos, but is there any tool sets for just kind of painting masks right into Nuke or do you yeah. really have to generate everything uh, we, outside of it? We've had this um, conversation in the office quite a lot because you know we all, as artists, like to do that. You know, we all we all like to kind of paint on the image, and I think um, I don't I don't think this is final production um, kind of workflow. Basically, I think this is a workflow that works really well while you're trying to get sign off of a lot of different elements of your process, and you're, you want to speed up that first seventy percent. Um, but I think that you will inevitably want to use Photoshop for the last, the last um, look, the last part of that process. You know, we're not, we're not saying that, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say that this should replace everything that you do in Photoshop, um, because what we ended up doing was using the power of Nuke and the 32-bit elements to get the levels and everything working really well, all the materials um, adjusted, and then kind of rendering that out um, as a kind of, an, you know, an EXR, to then start all that painting process in Photoshop, and I think you can see it like this. Even if you even if you use your um, even if you use it as it, to do your six Ks, what we ended up doing as a compromise with the, with the six Ks was doing exactly this, but then 
rendering it out and treating that, treating that render out um, from Nuke as our raw render in Photoshop. Right? So we're kind of starting off with a much better raw render in Photoshop. And then we can start painting and layering. We might even bring in the same masks and do, and do a few changes and things like that, using the changes to help, uh, using the kind of masks to help us paint. But what it does is it gives us a better RGB. It gives us a better starting point to, um, to work with in Nuke because it's much better than, um, than again, I touched on briefly before with um, what we do in Photoshop is we bring in the 32-bit the image and we create two, two copies of that image and create an underexposed and an overexposed to give ourselves the levels later on to play around with if we need it. You don't have to do that in Nuke because it's all 32-bit all the time. So that, that's, that's the process that it kind of allows us to, to use it for. So it's not a complete replacement for Photoshop. It just, it just gives us a speed up of the development process and potentially a, a, kind of, a kind of workflow to develop a much, much better RGB, which then we use in Photoshop to do what we do all, all the time normally anyway. I mean, I was expecting some of these processes to take a bit longer and, and for the um, more questions to be about Nuke because I thought it was a new, a new thing that everyone was learning. Hopefully I've kind of taught quite a few um, new things and new workflows to you guys today and you can kind of get a grasp of what Nuke's about. I'm more than happy to go back into any of the files that we've looked at today and, and, and explain everything again. It's, there are some kind of funny concepts that might get a bit of time to get used to, like the shuffle shuffle nodes and how the alphas are working. And if anyone wants any clarification on, on any of these things that we've talked about, now's the time to kind of ask these questions um, rather than uh, think that it's stupid to ask because, because I've already covered it. It's better just to go over things now rather than um, dwell on it later. I'll be stupid then. Um, the card trick that you showed, I think, is very interesting. The, can you, is it quick for you to show the workflow on how you bring in the 3D scene with the cards to how to put stuff on, which I think is very good. Yeah, so um, it's a good one to go over again because it is something that we use a lot um, within 3D. So if we look at our kind of static scene that we've still got open, we can see we've got our cards, you know, here and here. And again, it's just that plugin, uh, Nukem. Let's, I mean, let's put our card in somewhere slightly more, um, in a slightly better place. So let's, let's, um, let's put it on this screen here to make a bit more sense. Let's delete these ones. I've kind of got these TV screens here, right? Let's take this as a kind of little study and we'll put some materials on this in 3D as well. So we've got the cards. Let's move them a little bit in front of this geometry. So we press Nucom. We have to select our camera from our scene. We have to select our objects which are plane four and five. We've already got them selected, so it automatically has them selected in our, in our picker here. Outward path. Uh, let's have a look here. Nuke. Nucom. Let's create a new folder called O2. Output our Nuke script, output our Chan files. That's the only thing to really remember. You want to output your script and your Chan files. You, if you click that, it's just going to give you a pop-up window with what you've exported, which you don't really need to do. Um, we don't need to set our custom frame range. We're happy with um, 0 to 100. Does it very fast because it's a very simple movement. <coughs> Let's just uh, save this, and close this one down. Likewise with this one. Let's just open our file that we were in earlier on. Mm -hmm. 
It's easy school testing, I think. Delete this and do it again. So we're in Nuke. Let's bring in our um, file. So we have to go to File. And then we want to import script. We want to find that um, Nuke script that we've just exported. Which is in um, Nukem. O2, static scene that we've done there. And it automatically creates our script in exactly the way we need it to be. So let's just like line these up a little bit. And again, I get a little bit anal with how this all links up. Especially when you have really complicated comps, it's really nice to just Spend a while sorting it out. So our output render format is 1920 by 1080 because that's what we had in that file because um, we generated the still from that file. However, the, our animation um, that we rendered out is um, 1024 by 576. And our edit, our um, kind of new setting that we added, low HD, is, um, is there already by default. We don't need our environment color. So you can see here that we've got our screens exported there, and it's automatically linked here. What we'll go through is kind of a little bit of 3D in Nuke, and just realize where, that, where those features are. At the top here, you'll kind of see that we're actually in 2D mode. If we select 3D, we're going to get a 3D scene like, um, like you have in Max, right? If we select our um, card and try to find that, we can see that if we pan around for a little while, you have to kind of get used to the fact that every single software seems to have different shortcuts for moving around, which is super annoying. So if you press Alt and right click, random, you get, um, you get to spin around here. And you can see camera gizmo is massive, but um, you can see our kind of scene here. Let's try and locate our cards. which are hard to find. Everyone complains about the Nuke um, 3D system, but it is much, 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 much better than the After Effects 3D system. Um, it should just be like Max or Maya, and it should just be, have that capability, but it doesn't. If we kind of like look through our camera at this point, we might be able to locate our um, cards we still can't, or we can, it's not showing up. Let's just see. For some reason we can't actually see our cards. Let's just see if, if it's um, what happens if we put a texture on them. Let's load in a different map and try and um, replace these diffuse maps. See if we can see it that way. So we can definitely see it in 2D mode. If we click on our scene, we should be able to see it, but we can't. So let's just check it out. Unless they're just tiny. But essentially all you have to do to go from 3D to 2D is just go through the option here and just be aware of what your um, viewer is selected on to be able to see what's going on. But um, yeah, let's bring in a texture. Let's put something on this on these planes that isn't just um, a random texture from Max, because it will default generate a kind of like diffuse map based on um, the wire color for that texture. If you don't have anything, if you have a texture already assigned to this material in Max, then it will bring that in, which is quite nice, and it will add it in um, to as an image within here. 
Um, let's get some images on here. Let's get some of the Jonah artwork. Why not? The other thing is that if you're using the same texture, you don't have to copy it twice. You can just have it once, obviously, and just plug it. Just use common sense with a lot of these things. Let's just see, um, I've got a pre malt. Can't see them for some reason. Let's just check this out. We just replace this with a constant. If you need a solid color, like a um, like you can in After Effects, if you just go to, oops, tab constant, this will give you kind of like a solid, a solid blank color. Still isn't showing up in the viewport for some reason. Let's check this out. What I might do is just re-import that script. Okay, it's weird. So you can see them now. Um, so maybe there was just something that I didn't like that we changed. Um, so normally it just appears straight away and you can see it no problem. So it's not of interest, let's just try and replace these maps. Yeah. So didn't really do anything different um, unless it was to do with it changing the to the low HD, which is not. So yeah, we're not, not too sure why that didn't work. These are exactly the same. Um, but yeah, essentially you just have the, um, the texture and you can just replace the default textures that it has in Max very easily. Oops. Again, it's not fantastic to move around um, in Nuke, but it is a little bit. If we go back into, free, into uh, 2D, we can see that our textures are there. We can merge that over our raw footage. If we go add this within the A channel, then we've successfully replaced these walls with kind of some posters here. And if you wanted to um, say there was something in the way of this, or say um, you know this poster was behind these these spheres here. You can very easily add a mask. Um, if we just put a point just there, so we can see that we're bringing in, we're actually using our A channel there, not our mask. You could very easily um, mask this with any of our other elements. This is from the same starting point. We're gonna we're gonna kind of fudge this to kind of illustrate um, the kind of point because there's nothing in front of that. But with this other render um, that we did from the still, we do have a bit of glass that we created, um, which we can kind of use as a mask. These are in different sizes. So what we have to do is we have to add a reformat node. 
we want to change this to our low HD for the purpose of this. And then we want to mask, we want to mask that. It's not doing anything yet because we haven't selected our red channel. But you can see exactly what we're doing there. We've masked it with that red channel. Um, and we can very easily um, just invert that selection just within there. So we can do, we have full control. If we have, if, as long as we've got our masks, we can kind of like um, have things behind certain elements. Um, we can kind of render out smoke passes and have them more behind us, you know, these guys here. We can, have, we can have them in the background. We can do all sorts of things as long as we've got the right masks um, and everything's in the right um, scale. So hopefully that, you know, asks, answers your question or elaborates more on the, um, on the process of that. And you can see it kind of like this little green bar here. It's kind of loading into RAM. If we, um, if we just press play for a little bit, we'll see that we can kind of like cache that animation out. It's not going to move our mask because remember our mask is generated from our still image. image. So that's going to kind of um, move away. Nuke has a, um, a separate thing it uses. Um, oh, sorry, that's the frame range block. Uh, you can kind of go to Flipbook. And you can say, um, you know, render out, render out the viewer. And this is kind of, this is essentially rendering out the viewer so that you can um, preview your images, preview your animations. But I tend to, um, I tend to just use it within this bit here. Sometimes it's actually quicker to render out your sequence, the preview. I mean, Nuke 7, what we're using here, is much, much better in the viewport than the old Nuke used to be. Um, it's kind of comparable to After Effects now in the viewer, whereas because it uses RAM. In the previous version of Nuke, it uses the, it used the um, the C drive to um, to kind of cache out its kind of viewport. Whereas now, since Nuke Seven came out last year, it's um, it uses the kind of full full extent of the RAM in the viewport, which which has made it much faster. And um, Nuke Eight Nuke Eight comes out in a few um, weeks as well, so that'll be interesting to see. So were there any other kind of like um, things that anyone wanted me to go back over or really ex re-explain? Uh, so the question online here, there's a few of them here. Um, in the green screen, if you use black points, how do you remove them later? I'm assuming you must mean the tracking markers. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just very simply, um, we didn't really have that problem in this shot because obviously the kind of it's so relatively small and pix and, and not pixelated. Um, <clears throat> normally, you'd have to just rotate them out or paint them out. I mean, you'd only paint them out in this case. You'd rotate them out because you don't want any of the green screen. For example, if we if we wanted to um, like a question when we did the tracking um, section on day two was that how would you get would you have put tracking markers on on the footage in the um, in the street scene? Um, if we just go to that seen again, we're all probably sick of looking at, but uh, it illustrates it quite well. Um, so if we go to our street scene and look at this shot, one of the questions when we were tracking this shot was, would you add tracking markers on the walls and things like that? And uh, we didn't need to because we felt like the textures were enough. Um, but if we added tracking markers, like green tracking markers, then we would have to manually paint those out. Um, and there's, there's a few techniques, which I'm not too experienced in, to be honest, about of um, kind of roto painting out um, things on the walls. And essentially how that works is you'd, you'd put cards in place of where those, um, where you want to kind of um, clone. And then you kind of like, there's a few ways you can do it that I'm aware of, but not that experienced of in, in because I've never had to really do it to any level of intensity. But it gets a little bit more complicated in Nuke when you have to, um, you can essentially camera project um, your footage onto a card and then offset that within the time, within the time frame and take a part, of the, um, a part of the texture that hasn't got that on and offset and feather that with a roto in that area. So I'm, it's, it, I'm not competent in that technique enough to explain it simpler than that. But there are lots of ways where you can roto uh, paint out or clone out or offset time project out 
um, markers that you put onto um, your street scene. But in the, um, in the case of this, it was much simpler because you just roto, if, the, if any of this remained after keying, which it luckily didn't, um, then you would just simply roto that out in a, in a big roto mat, um, like, like the ones we're doing here. This is kind of like isolating everything outside and cutting it out. But if you did still get um, little guys here, uh, then you would just manually roto them out in the green screen. You'd only have to paint out if you put tracking markers on a, um, on a live location that you wanted to keep. Uh, next one here. How do you make cloud shadows and time la in time lapse scenes on 3D buildings or objects like a beach scene? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and um, one that I haven't got the files with me to explain. Um, there was these files were very heavy, and I couldn't couldn't bring the entire Jonah um, package with me. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I can explain that quite easily because it was a huge challenge. We did a time lapse, obviously. Um, shadows kind of casting on all of our um, uh, raw footage. And then if we added CG into that, how are we going to at all replicate that? And the way we did it was a lot of testing with the, um, the V-Ray environment fog and using a noise map to generate clouds with that system, um, which was attached to a box hovering above the, um, the scene. And then what we did was we animated that noise map and moved the box um, so that um, when our direct light, which is a simple V-Ray sun and sky system, when that kind of um, shone through that box, it casted um, shadows from our environment fog onto our, onto our objects. So we weren't actually using the environment fog to see, to see the fog, um, so we didn't really care what resolution or, um, or detail we had in, that, in those clouds. Um, we, just, um, we just used it to um, cast shadows back onto our geometry. And then it was just doing a few tests, um, seeing the speed that things had to go on. And for those of you who don't know the V-Ray environment fog, um, And there's a really great tutorial um, that teaches you how to do clouds. Let's have a find for that. Look. So you can see how it's used for kind of distance fog and things like that, kind of na and natural Z depth. You can use it for generating um, kind of volumetric effects, but you can also use it for clouds. And there's a very easy tutorial that's on this website here. It's the first link when you Google V-Ray environment fog, and it teaches you exactly how to um, generate clouds from um, creating a box, attaching your kind of environment fog within that box, using a kind of noise or smoke map and things like that, and then um, having certain settings to, um, to kind of get the light to bounce within that space a bit more naturally. And it's a very easy um, thing to set up, and there's video tutorials that show you how to do it. So. Um, check that out if you want to learn more about that. So we, we did literally this tutorial. Um, I, I learned this a long time ago and um, used this in a slightly different way within that shot on the beach scene, basically, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next question here. Uh, how do you know that a scene is not trackable? If you're shooting outdoor buildings, uh, what, are, what should I see to know that it's a trackable scene? Um, Let's bring the raw footage of this scene into Nuke and just see. I think you have to, it's a, I guess that's an experience thing. Um, I knew that when we were making that shot, that I didn't want to put tracking markers on all those walls um, because there was so much texture. And again, I think we covered that a little bit when we were talking about tracking on day two, where there was a question, you know, did we need to put tracking markers on the wall? And, and it was a conversation between um, what was going to be the most work, tracking that shot without the tracking markers or painting out um, all of those tracking markers, you know, from, from the scene. So it was a kind of time, it was a time thing, what, what, what was going to be the quickest, easiest thing to do. And um, for us, we, we felt confident with our experience that we would um, be able to track that scene because there was so much texture on the walls, you know. Um, I mean, if we, if we go back into that, um, scene and just just to see when we color corrected the footage and um, before we tracked it um, just how much how much kind of like um, data was there and how textured the walls were you know let's just open this scene up and just have another look at the texture on the walls uh, which is kind of lost a little bit on the flat footage but when you're there 
you can see it. So I saw the texture and thought, no, you didn't need to, didn't need to track it. So it's, it's a judgment call with a, with a little bit of experience, I think. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question while we're kind of loading, loading the scene. Uh, maybe in the interim you can answer this one here. Uh, he wants an explanation of rolling shutter and how to correct it. Okay. So while this is loading, we'll load After Effects. Let's just throw every program we've got at this machine now. Um, let's open up full. We've got Photoshop open as well. Didn't realize that. <laughs> okay, let's close down Photoshop. Okay, uh, let's bring in our footage, which is our EXR sequence here, for example. Um, what was the question again, sorry? Oh, yeah. So yeah, simply, we don't have to do this for our, um, for our Alexa footage, but most of the time, unless you're working on a big project with a big camera, um, you'll be using um, 5Ds or, or equivalent to, and essentially what you need to do, it's very simple. Um, on a new adjustment layer, you want to do a um, distortion, and then it's a rolling shutter repair. And you can see, even on the Alexa, it's made a subtle difference, and on a 5D, it'll make a dramatic difference. And in, if I can illustrate this um, in Photoshop, actually. just by drawing some lines. Um, in the same way that Nuke, when you go to a new node, it's kind of scanning the image down. You see how it's scanning it down? That's exactly how your camera records, or your 5D certainly, records your, um, your images, right? So it's constantly scanning and capturing your, um, your images when you're filming, right? And the problem is that if you have kind of fast moving objects, what's happening when, you, when you're kind of scanning stuff is that you're going, to get, you're going to get kind of distortion. So when you're scanning things, you're going to get, you're going to get this kind of like subtle bowing of the images. That's, that's the distortion, right? And what the um, camera shutter fix does is that it essentially creates a straight line from your, sh from your distortion. So it kind of compensates for this kind of scanning effect, creating that distortion. Because if, if, ob if this object is moving very fast, you know, you're going to get this bowing of the, of, the, of the kind of image there, or whatever the object is. Whereas what the camera shutter fix does, it just makes everything dead straight. And it's a, it's a point and click thing in, in After Effects. And this one, the rolling shutter repair in After Effects CS6 is better than the, um, well, PF track's not loading anyway, but it's, it's better than the, um, than the PF track shutter fetch, basically. So it's better to, what I would do, first of all, I wouldn't grade anything in, um, in After Effects necessarily, but I would bring in my footage. I'd say, okay, my frame range is going to be from here to, to wherever. I mean, we've lost a few frames here. We've only exported a few frames in this, in this case. So our frame ranges from here to here. We've got our rolling shutter fix. I'd, um, and, then, and then I'd export this um, as EXRs again and um, call it uh, the same as whatever you want to call it, but then with shutter repair at the end. So then you know what, what you're working with. And then I'd bring that into PF track and start tracking, basically. So that's the kind of workflow I'd use. Okay, the next question is, uh, he wants to know the name of the device you use for capturing your HDRI environments, and then what software you're using to combine the HDRs to make them into a panoramic image. Yeah, um, again, it was so long ago when we did that, um, but the, we use a promote control for um, creating our HDRIs. And what this is, is it's a, um, it's a bit of kit like this. It plugs directly into your camera and you can essentially capture multi-bracketed um, exposures uh, very easily. You can also do loads more stuff with it. You can, um, you can create um, time lapses and set 
you know, it set the camera to take photos every however many seconds, but there's a lot, it's one of the best controllers for, um, for that kind of thing. And it's got lots of different features on it and it's really easy to set up. We needed, some, basically we, we initially bought a whole shed load of um, garden mirror balls. And then we, um, we did some tests in the office and they worked okay, but <laughs> we were kind of running around in Zanzibar and we needed to kind of get um, in and out of these locations very quickly. We only had a certain amount of relatively controlled time for the filming. And once that time ran out, the whole crew moved and I had to kind of set up a tripod and a, and a kind of um, capture the lighting of that before the whole place got crazy again with, um, with all the people moving around. So it had to be very fast. Um, and these, these bits of kits really help you with, um, with capturing these things very quickly. So there's a few tutorials, but there's probably specific to what camera you've got, so make sure you're doing it correctly. But these, they're not too expensive. Um, they're not like cheapest chips, but they're not too expensive. They're definitely affordable for most studios. And um, yeah, it's just going through the settings um, there to explain it. Um, the other thing we used was a, <clears throat> was a Nodal Ninja. And essentially what this is, is a, um, a bit of kit which attaches to your tripod and, and your camera and allows you to rotate accurately on 45 degrees. This is less important to have, but really, really useful um, to have if you've got the money. Um, so yeah, it just makes it, we can be very accurate. We can start off on, um, on zero, move to 90, 180, 270, um, and so on. So we've created four, um, four kind of uh, 90 degree angle, um, seven bracket exposures of our, each of our locations. So we can, we can do that. Um, and you'll have to forgive me because I've forgotten how we kind of merged all this in Photoshop. Essentially what we did was we, we um, brought, um, we brought in the, all of our different brackets and created a HDRI from the different JPEG exposures. And then each of those HDRIs were then um, merged into a panorama. And I, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it's all within Photoshop, um, but it's been so long since I've done it. There are, there are um, a few different um, softwares that kind of try and do it manually. Um, we were talking about one at lunchtime, if one, someone can remember uh, what it was called again. PT GUI, yeah, that's the one. We have played with that. Um, how do you spell PT GUI? G -U -I. So that, yeah, this is the exact one that we played with before. Um, I'm pretty sure you can do um, this in Photoshop as well now in CS6. Um, but check this out for kind of like stitching, stitching things together. Yeah, so this, the conversation in the studio here about um, this being better than the inbuilt Photoshop one um, and being having more control over how things are stitched and creating control points. I found that the, the one in CS6 is a, a lot, lot better than, than any of the other versions I've used in Photoshop. Um, we did a shoot recently, a helicopter shoot, um, like on a drone, which recorded 360s and we created the panoramas very easily uh, within those. Um, but I think the way that you um, unstitch the kind of, or restitch the kind of um, the mirror ball images will probably be a little bit more, more complicated. But um, yeah, check this out. And just do a little bit of research on, um, on, on HDRIs. There's some really good um, people out there doing interesting things. What's um, uh, the guy we met? The guy we met several times in Spain. Yeah, Paul de Bebek. Let's Google Paul de Bebek. He, he's um, how do you, you spell de Bebek? See, so already knows. He's very. He's known on Google. This is the guy. Me and Jeff met him a few times. Um, he does really interesting things, and he kind of invented the HDRI workflow, if, that, if I'm correct, Jeff. Um, so, um, HDR shop. I think that was even the one we used, actually. Come to think of it. Um, so this is this is kind of like. Look at this guy. He's done some really interesting stuff. He he basically masterminded the whole HDR workflow. Um, so it's worth checking out some stuff he's doing. Um, he also um, 
has got this crazy, he's got a rubbish website. He, he's got this crazy um, light, what's it called? His, his, his big uh, light stage thing, yeah. Try and Google light stage, it's fantastic. Um, oops. This is a book though, isn't it? Yeah, so what he's done is he's created a um, several different light stage um, kind of like massive rigs which have these kind of spherical lights all around. And what it does is it, it creates diffuse, specular, bump, um, shadows. It, it creates all, ma all type of map types from real objects. Um, so the, it, it's used m more in, um, in kind of like the film industry for characters, for example, it was kind of used heavily in the curious case of Benjamin Button to capture Brad Pitt's head and Kate Blanchett's head um, and create very realistic specular normal maps. So that the, essentially the, um, the diffuse map would be a map which had no um, kind of specular or reflection data on it. Um, and it, I've got a minimal knowledge on how that kind of works, but it's basically kind of Taking the uh, images from um, taking images from lots of different positions, but also having the lights on and off in different positions as well, so that you're kind of getting the full light data um, and then adding that together in different ways. Uh, he's got some great stuff online, which kind of explains it a lot better than I could. But um, it's used by um, he, people have used his kind of like systems all over the world um, to kind of uh, for their actors and different things that they need to create digitally. So hopefully just if you kind of go through some of the kits and some of the kind of software um, that's used, so I couldn't be more specific than that, but um, hopefully this will get you researching yourself and into some really interesting people out there doing some good stuff and what the, what the good kit is for kind of um, creating these things. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, someone, uh, again, here just suggested that um, you don't necessarily need the, um, if we go back to our, not on this one. Go to another one. It's getting that time of day, I think. But um, wait for this computer to respond again. But the point was is that you don't need to um, have a fisheye lens that we've had for um, creating these things. It's better to, um, but you can just create more um, more images. The Nerdle Ninja, you can um, you can not only rotate um, around a kind of X Y, but you can also kind of pivot and um, rotate around Z as well. So you can kind of create more images facing up and down if you don't have a lens as wide as that. Um, and it just means there's more stitching and more kind of um, more images to kind of process. But you don't have to necessarily have a full spherical fisheye lens. Let's just go here and uh, yeah. yeah, and the uh, V-Ray elements, I noticed you use, I guess, V-Ray normal before. What do you actually use that for in compositing? Um, we don't use it much, to be honest. We've used it for kind of, um, the normal map is the same as rendering out uh, a red, blue, green mask it's essentially the same red blue green data just spread across your model so we've used it um, you can use it in a grade node and you can select the green channel and then you can grade just the tops of, of your model slightly differently um, and it's kind of a cheating way of relighting there are way more complicated ways of using the normal maps with point position passes with their nuke to kind of relight things in really interesting ways and i'm not going to go to that level of detail today um, we've i've experimented with it a little bit not enough to kind of um do tutorials for but um, I am aware of the different features that you can that you can use it in, uh, and if we, if we felt like we needed to relight something, then I could probably figure it out. But um, yeah, the uh, we've we've definitely used it for grading um, different sides of the models, basically, um, which which can be really nice. Uh, you can do the same thing in uh, in Photoshop just by selecting the red um, in the channels if you load the um, 
the normal map in there. Uh, and it, you can, it's the same thing. You can do it in lots of different programs. It's not just Nuke-based. We, we use it for that purpose, basically. OK, so um, question online was, um, now we're back on now. We've restarted the machine. Question online was, um, can we show the document again that uh, we kind of took to site with what data we needed to kind of capture to kind of you know get all of the information that we needed? So that would be on um, our day two tracking thing, and it's basically we created a Jonah VFX outline. And if we look at this again, it kind of shows. Um, kind of an outline of the different scenes. It kind of has like a general um, kind of like information, like, um, you know, what kind of kit we need, what kind of things we need for the environments, what software we're going to use. Um, different links to kind of like um, tutorials for kind of creating HDRIs from mirror balls. Um, you know, different links that we've kind of accumulated to kind of make sure that we know what we're doing. Um, references to kind of good visual effects breakdowns. It was a great one for children of men. Um, you know, just general kind of like um, resources really that we kind of want to collect. And then just a schedule. Um, and this kind of runs through um, the different kind of scenes. So Stone Town Street Day. Um, let's just make sure we're both them down. Um, fish Market. How many, how many kind of shots and how many setups we anticipate. Um, if it requires any kind of additional lighting, um, any kind of extra footage from the 5D, for example, in the street, in the kind of um, market stuff, it wasn't all shot on the Alexa, some of which was shot on the, um, on the 5D. So it was just making sure we were, um, were kind of writing down what we needed um, and where. Sorry. Um, again, if we needed sound, if we need uh, what kind of VFX are included in these shots. Um, yeah, so we had a whole list of information that we wanted to try and capture for each, each of the kind of areas. And then in detail, um, for in detail for each of the kind of scenes, we used a kind of still from the previous. Um, if we try and find again our street scene. So this was our still from the previous for the street scene that we did. So we're looking at what the camera type. Um, shot info, town transforms as the camera walks through the streets of Stone Town, right? So this is what's happening. Camera type, Alexa, we kind of scribbled this in um, when we were on, on location, just with like pencils and stuff. And um, we had uh, what lens we were using, what focal length, what aperture, if the camera's fixed or if it's um, you know, a bit handheld or on a steady cam, that would be noted here. Whether it needs any green screen, whether it needs tracking markers, which has been a point of today, does this scene need tracking markers? Probably not. Um, does it need a mirror ball capture or Rather, does it need our, um, you know, promote and our, mul our multiple um, ex exposure brackets on our mirror, on our mirror, um, mirrored lens that we got? Is it going to need roto in post production? Definitely. Um, and do we need a checkerboard capture? Yes. And we obviously needed that to, to undistort our lens easily within uh, within PF track. So that's basically the kind of list of that we that we kind of get, and we kind of. Um, one of the people that were going to help us with the VFX for the underwater were, was initially Framestore. We had a few meetings with Framestore, um, and it was this this list came out of a conversation with one of their um, kind of lead technical directors. So I, I had a conversation with him, and we kind of talked about what we would need before we went out there. And uh, this is the kind of list, simple list that we came up with. So you don't really need to get everything. Sometimes, if you're kind of like doing lots of CG and you're replacing things, you might need to capture photos behind some of the structures so you might need to go behind some of these buildings and actually like take photos and you just use your common sense with what you might need so you were getting rid of this building completely you're replacing it with something where you actually saw through it you need to go around the back of this building and um, and take pictures to be able to rebuild that scene efficiently rather than rather than creating 3d so it's just being aware of um, what you need to capture and, um, and and how to get it really so yeah hopefully that answers answers that question from online uh, so I repeat that. Yep. Um, so the question was, do we slate our shots? Do we have a kind of a clipper board? And um, yeah, you can see that if we play the original footage from the original frame range. Um, so if we take our street scene footage, and this is quite large, we'll see if this plays. It should do. 
So in VLC, or QuickTime. You can see here, we slate it. Um, we know what's, what take and what, um, oops, what, uh, you know, scene it is, slate, take, and then this is the, then we you know which one we, uh, we're capturing here. And this will, we'll be writing this down also in our visual effects guide. So this will be like, um, uh, we'll write down like the takes, um, if, if, if the kind of lenses change or if the focal length changes on all of those takes, we'll write down um, the varying numbers from those takes within here. So we'll know that um, if, we, if we're choosing take three, we'll know that the third number within this focal length is the one that we actually went with and we can type that camera data into our, into our tracking system. So yeah, we do, we do capture all of that information. And it was just a conversation with, the, um, with one of the camera helpers um, who was writing down all of this information for his records. So he would then tell me all of these different things that I could write in my document as well. So yeah, was there any more questions at all from today um, about any of the kind of rendering or post-production that we had or should we wrap it up there? Nothing online, anything in the room? Good. <laughs> been a long three days hopefully everyone enjoyed it all right well if that's uh, everything I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out this week especially everybody online who uh, put up with all of our breaks and uh, extended lunches and uh, worked all through the night to, to watch this with us I also really want to thank Paul um, he spent a lot of time on this pre presentation I know and, uh, a lot of stress so thank you Paul for uh, for coming over here and doing this for us <laughs>